All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And we're very sorry about that little glitch. We got to love technology sometimes. Um, so just to not uh, waste any more time, I did want to real quick, so that way if anybody um, wasn't able to hear, briefly go over some of webinar housekeeping before we get started. Um, brief reminder that uh, you will be in listen only mode, so all attendees will be muted uh, for the duration of the webinar. If you do have any questions, comments that you want to shoot over to uh, Jennifer, please utilize the chat box. Um, and for audio access, you may use your computer audio or try calling in with your phone. Um, and also, again, any presentation slides that Jennifer has created for us today uh, will also be available for you to download. So that way, if you ever need to uh, reference back, um, need any other information or resources, you can always view those at a later time. Um, and so for anyone who did miss our uh, previous introduction, I'm here today with nurse practitioner Jennifer Hartman. Um, and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so it is very fitting that we have um, Jennifer here with us who specializes in women's and breast health specifically. Um, she also has a really touching um, and personal story with breast can or bre breast health as well. And so uh, with that, I will turn it on over to Jennifer so she can share her story um, and present with us today. Thank you so much again for having uh, being here with us. Thank you, Jessica. I would like to start with first sharing a little bit about my story. Let me make sure I can, perfect. Trying to flip through, there we go. Perfect, I'll start with my story so you can really understand where I'm coming from and why I'm so passionate about this topic. Breast cancer really started to impact my life before I was even born. My dad's mother, so my paternal grandmother, passed away when he was nine years old from breast cancer when she was only 36. I never got to meet her, and I've actually never even seen a picture of her, so I've never had a face on breast cancer. But at the time that she had breast cancer in the 1950s, breast cancer was still seen as a really shameful and embarrassing disease. So they were living in the New York City area at the time, and my grandfather was a builder. So he moved out, uh, out of the city into a suburb and bought an entire street. And he started by building a home for his family, and then he continued to build homes down the street to provide for his family. Later, my dad grew up and inherited that home, married my mom, had my brother and I, and that home became the home that built my childhood, the home that was originally built to provide my grandmother with a dignified death. Since hearing that story my entire childhood, I knew I always wanted to grow up and help others. So I became a nurse practitioner when I was 23 years old, I worked in OBGYN, followed by working nine years in surgical breast oncology. One day at work, I decided to do my own genetic testing, that BRCA testing. I don't know, have you heard of that before? Yes, yes. It, it's BRCA, it simply stands for breast cancer. You may have heard of BRCA1, BRCA2 testing. That's just breast cancer one, breast cancer two. The test isn't looking to see if you have the gene. We all have the gene, they're really good genes. They're tumor suppressor genes, so they're part of what helps protect us from ever getting cancer in the first place. So when we're doing the test, we're looking to see if you have a mutation in the gene that essentially makes it not work or broken so you don't have as much protection. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, so I went ahead and did the test on myself. I was in my 20s at the time uh, and was pretty shocked to find out that I actually did inherit a BRCA1 gene mutation from my dad. And so presumably his mother also was positive BRCA1, which makes sense. She had a very aggressive, very young breast cancer. I knew from helping hundreds and hundreds of women through their breast cancer journey that I did not want to watch and wait for a breast cancer to develop. I wanted to do everything that I possibly could do to prevent it. So when I was 29 years old, I had a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. I never regretted it for a moment, uh, and I'm really happy I did it. It brought my risk of developing breast cancer from about 85% down to about 2 to 3%. Mm -hmm. So huge relief. When I had that surgery, I thought, great, the history of breast cancer is behind me at that point. Um, but little did I know everything would change. Just a few years later, uh, we were actually at a family trip in Disney World, and we're that family, the ones that wear like the matching shirts, and we go to all four parks in the same day and eat our weight and popcorn and those Mickey ice cream bars. <laughs> and we were having a blast. And my mom stepped out at breakfast one morning to use the restroom, and my dad leaned over and whispered, 
your mom has a lump and she's too scared to tell anybody. So I was hoping it's probably nothing, right? Probably some kind of cyst, don't, don't freak out about it. Um, but the following week I did go visit her at her home and asked her what was going on. She said that she had felt this lump for several months, but she was too afraid to tell anybody and was too scared to get a mammogram. So I offered to do an exam right there in her home. Uh, and the moment I felt her breast, uh, all the wind was sucked out of my lungs. I, I wasn't sure if I was gonna vomit or if I could even stand up straight. I only had a few moments to really put together the fact that I was standing in my mother's bathroom, holding her breast cancer in my hands, knowing it was one of the worst breast cancers I had seen in my career. Mm -hmm. I got her in the very next day with all the top specialists. She started chemotherapy right away. She did uh, dose dense chemotherapy followed by mastectomy with all the lymph nodes removed, removed from that arm, radiation treatment, uh, and then pill therapy that she would be on for the rest of her life. She did really well. I was really proud of her and I got to be with her for almost every single visit through that treatment. Uh, unfortunately, a couple years later, she called me one day and said, um, Jen, I just don't feel very good. She was nauseous, uh, weak, and, and and a lot of pain. So I told her to go to the hospital that Tuesday. She went to the hospital and was found to be in liver failure from where the breast cancer had spread to her liver. Uh, and she passed away that Saturday morning. Thankfully, I did get to be right next to her, holding her hand for her very last breath. And while that story sounds very sad, I am not a sad story. I had a mother that loved me more than anything in the world. Uh, and then now, because of technology, hopefully will be one of the first women uh, in several generations to not die of breast cancer mm -hmm. in my family. And I have a lot of hope for the future. I have a little daughter who's two, uh, and hopefully in 20, 25 years, we'll have even greater technology in the breast cancer space um, that will be able to, to benefit my daughter. So I really love this quote from Malala Yousafzai that states, I tell my story, not because it's unique, but because it is not. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, breast cancer actually became the most common cancer in the world. So I hope today you can see the fire in me that uh, is, is burning to tell as many people as I can what they can do to help protect themselves and their, their loved ones. And hopefully uh, after you hear some information today that lights a little flame in you to make some changes in your own life. I do believe that the power we have is when we combine knowledge around something with actionable steps we can make actual life-saving changes. So I'm gonna start with giving you some knowledge and help turn you all into, into breast specialists, breast radiologists, so you really understand your own health. And then I'll leave you with a few steps that you could literally start taking today uh, that will help uh, improve your personal plan for your own breast health. So I'm gonna start with giving you breast anatomy 101. If you're not a, a biology major, don't panic. It's actually one of the easiest um, organs of the body to understand. So this picture right here is a cross section of the breast. Mm. Starting from the right side, the thick pink line is the skin. Then you move in, going left, you see the yellow, and the yellow is just all fat tissue. A lot of the breast is made up of fat tissue. Then you see these uh, large red blobs with pink polka dots in them, and those are to represent the lobules. Now the lobules are what create and produce and store the milk. And then coming off of those lobules are dark red, maroon colored thin lines. Those lines track to the nipple, and those are called the ducts. And the ducts are kind of the transportation system. So the lobules produce and store the milk, and then it travels down the ducts out the nipple to feed a baby. And that's really what makes up the breast tissue. Behind that is some more yellow, which would be more fat. And then behind that, you're starting to hit your chest wall. So your muscle, your ribs, and then your heart and your lungs. So for fun, anyone listening right now, does anyone have any guesses of where the most common location of breast cancer is in the breast? Now that you understand the anatomy of the breast, where do you think most breast cancers occur? And you can feel free to um, throw a guess in the chat box. The answer is on this slide. So it's one of the one of the areas we've labeled. Do you have any guesses, Jessica? I would say the lobules. The lobules. Now that's a good guess. Okay. It's actually the ducts. Okay. Ductal carcinoma. 
uh, is by far the most common place of the breast to develop breast cancer, but you certainly can have a lobular breast cancer. Uh, less common, but definitely the second most common. Um, so you're going to develop breast cancer where there's breast tissue. So it's going to be in the ducts or the lobules. Perfect. Now to the next slide. Now that we know where breast cancer develops, how how common do you think breast cancer is in the United States? One out of how many women in the United States do you guys think develop breast cancer? One in 20, one in 50, one in 100. Any guesses on the chat box? One in, five. One in fives we're seeing. Did you have a guess? Yeah, I was going to say one in four. One in four. So that. So thankfully, you guys are both wrong. Okay. <laughs> because that's hopefully that, higher. That's, yeah. So it's about lower. one. <laughs> it's one in eight. Okay. So about twelve percent. Um, still, uh, honestly, very common. Most people know at least eight women in their family, or eight female friends, or eight female coworkers. So you're going to know someone uh, if it's not yourself a friend or family member that develops breast cancer. Now, something that not everyone realizes is that men do develop breast cancer as well. Men have breast tissue, just a lot less and, and less uh, estrogen and progesterone to, to feed that breast cancer, but it is possible. Do you guys have any guesses of how common breast cancer is in men? It is much less common. I have been two for two so far being wrong, so <laughs> no. I don't know about this one. <laughs> One out of 30, one out of 40. It's actually one in 833. Wow. So less than 1%. So you can see the stark difference in why it tends to be known more as a female disease. But I really caution people against associating it as only a female disease because while it's less common in men for sure, when I was working in, in breast care, we may, may have treated um, five, 600 women a year, but we still had about four or five men a year. And typically, male breast cancer is found uh, later stage uh, simply because it is not thought of and, and not worked up that way. If a man finds a lump, they don't tend to run in as fast or think of breast cancer. And sometimes mm -hmm. even their medical providers don't think of breast cancer. So I encourage you to still have this information in the back of your mind. If you yourself are a man or there's uh, any men that, are, uh, that you love in your life that you still are aware it's a possibility and encourage them if they have any changes to get that evaluated. You might go into this in a little bit, but I did, um, are men supposed to be checking just like how we do, women do breast exams and stuff? Is that something that men should be doing as well or is it not as black and white like that? Yeah, they certainly can. There's a lot of controversy around self-breast exams and there are no guidelines that specify that men should be doing self-breast exams unless they have certain genetic uh, mutations that put them at higher risk. Uh, we know like BRCA2 carriers have higher risk of male breast cancer specifically, but um, it's not a bad idea that if they're aware of their body, uh, they would do an exam exactly the same as how a woman would which would just be feeling the breast tissue. They just have a lot less to feel, less layers and a smaller smaller area to feel, but they would be looking for the same exact symptoms, which most of the time presents with a lump. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So now I'm gonna jump into some early detection and risk reduction ways. So now that we know 12% of women develop breast cancer, what are some things that we can do to find it early or reduce that 12% in the first place? So starting with early detection, you already got us going with this, is the, the self-breast exam or self-awareness is what it's sometimes coined. Uh, and really you're just looking and feeling with various pressures over the entire area of breast tissue, which does go up to the collarbone, into the armpit, and then down under where like an underwire of a bra would be. It doesn't really matter the pattern you go in. Some people go in an up and down pattern, some go in a spiral. The whole point of that is just to help you not miss an area. Uh, so whatever pattern works best for you. You want to feel with various pressures, meaning lightly, so you're feeling things right below the skin, a medium firmness, and then a more deep firmness closer 
to the ribs or the chest wall. Um, that way, in case of breast cancer was very superficial or very deep, you're not missing one of those, those layers. Uh, if you do feel any difference, you can certainly go get it evaluated right away, or you can keep a written record of it, draw two circles on a piece of paper, mark exactly what you feel and where you feel it. And especially in a young woman who's still having regular periods, if you wait a couple weeks, some things might go away. But if it doesn't, then definitely have it checked out. The nice thing about doing those regularly, and by regularly, I mean like once every couple months, once every month at the most, would be that you're going to be more comfortable with what normal is. A lot of people say, I'm lumpy bumpy all over. I don't know what the heck I'm feeling. Well, the hope is you feel that lumpy bumpiness. And if there's a new lump, it stands out to you like a sore thumb because you're so mm -hmm. used to feeling that Something regular terrible. lumpiness. Whereas if it's your first time feeling, you don't really know what's been there or is new. Some of the symptoms you're looking for would be warmth and redness, nipple discharge, swelling, uh, a rash or any skin changes, changes in size or shape, and then a lump, which is oftentimes the most common symptom that you're going to see. Most lumps are thankfully not breast cancer, so it's easier said than done, but try not to go into full panic mode, uh, but definitely worth having it evaluated. An additional way that you can have some uh, early detection would be going for your regular well women's exam. During that exam, they should offer a breast exam. Um, you can also voice any concerns you have. You can also get a breast cancer risk assessment. So they should be able to take in your personal history, your family history, and there are approved national calculators that will tell you what your risk of developing breast cancer is. If you know that you're higher risk, then you may want to do something more than what we would do for someone who's average risk. And then also inquiring about genetic testing. If you do have that family history, you may qualify for genetic testing, which could give you another piece of information on what's best for you. And then mammography, which is what most people think of first when they think of early detection. Now, I'm going to help you guys learn a little bit about mammograms so you can be radiologists yourself. A mammogram is just an x-ray, just like you would get an x-ray of your ankle or your wrist. It takes two pictures of each breast, one that's up and down and one that's side to side. If you've had a mammogram, you kind of know what that feels like. It's a little bit of pressure to try to stabilize the breast tissue and see through it. We usually start mammograms at age 40 in the United States. Um, now, if you do have a family history, like your aunt had breast cancer at 48, we'd want you to start 10 years prior to that youngest person diagnosed. Oh. So it'd be 38. Okay. So we do adjust to make it make sense for what your personal and family history is. Now, I'll show you some pictures of some mammograms here because we're going to talk about breast density as well. Here's four images of four different women's mammograms. And you can kind of tell by the image, this is that picture that's going side to side, not up and down, kind of like you're looking at them from the side. Um, and looking from the left to the right, A, that breast you can see is mostly a dark gray color, maybe a dot or two of white, but mostly a dark gray. And then B, you can see dark gray with some speckling of white closer to um, where the nipple would be. And then C, you see a lot of white, probably taking over at least 50 to 60% of the breast. And D, probably about 80%, 90% of that breast has that white patchiness. So when the x-ray beam goes through the breast, when it hits something solid, it shows up as white. In an ideal world, when it hits a breast cancer, which is solid, you would see this white shape. It usually looks like a star shape. And sometimes we can see them when they're millimeters, even you know less than a centimeter. So you'd see this small white star shape, irregular shape in the breast. Now when it hits dense breast tissue, which is just breast tissue, those ducts and lobules we talked about, it's that breast tissue, it's just stacked on top of each other really tight. It doesn't have that fat to fluff it out as much. And that could be a combination of things. Young people who have really hormonally active breast tissue, really lean people who don't have a lot of fat tissue, or people who just genetically don't have a lot of fat tissue in, in their breast area. So that really densely compacted uh, breast tissue, when the x-ray beam goes through, it hits that, and that shows up as white. And that's what you're seeing with that white patchiness uh, on the mammograms. So now you're looking for a white breast cancer among white breast tissue. Mm -hmm. Makes it really tricky to find um, to find any kind of breast cancer. It has improved. Now we have 3D mammography, uh, which helps quite a bit. 
It works kind of like a CAT scan where you can cut through the layers of the breast and look through like you're reading the pages of a book. Um, but we still know that if you're in that C or D category, we actually do have to notify you by law that your mammogram just isn't as good. And so in that case, we either offer additional imaging or at least the education to know that you should be relying on things more than just your mammogram. Is that when you would maybe do people in this category have to get a biopsy or is that only then if there's a concern? Because I've heard about yes. when you have dense uh, breast tissue with a uh, mammogram that typically then that next step people sometimes will do is an automatic biopsy. Is that true or false? Or? Not necessarily a biopsy, only if there is a, a concern. concern, but you would do um, more imaging like an MRI or an ultrasound or even just having the knowledge that you're dense. So that way uh, you don't totally trust it. If you feel something on self-exam or at the doctor's appointment, you trust your gut and that change that you see. Now jumping into some risk reduction, these are things that you can actually do to reduce your risk. So take that 12% and bring it down. Um, now these have all been shown in research that there's a statistically significant reduction in breast cancer, and that's exercising regularly, having a healthy body weight. We know that there's estrogen receptors in fat tissue, so higher body fat percentage, higher estrogen, which is what typically feeds breast cancer. Alcohol, keeping your alcohol level low. Um, and for women, that's defined as one less than one drink regularly per day. So mm -hmm. trying not to drink most days. Uh, red meat consumption has been shown to increase risk. Smoking, mm -hmm. which increases many cancers. And then having a healthy vitamin D level has also been shown to be cancer protective. On the right side, I put some things that are less modifiable, but still nice to know. If you have your first child less than the age of 30, that's been shown to have a lower risk of breast cancer, and then women who breastfeed. And it's shown to have the most benefit if you breastfeed two years. It does not need to be consecutively, but when you add up breastfeeding through your lifetime, that's also slightly reduced breast cancer risk. So now that you know some techniques, it's important to know what your risk is. And like I mentioned earlier, you can get a risk assessment at your doctor's office. That average risk individual, that's the person that has the 12% or one in eight, is gonna be anyone who's a female in the United States. Just by being a female, you have that 12% risk. You don't have to have any relatives, nothing abnormal in your own personal history. But now an increased risk is gonna be those women that have close family members that have had breast cancer. They may have had a biopsy in the past that showed something that's uh, kind of precancerous. We call it atypia. So it's an abnormal finding that's not cancer, but starts to give us a little bit of a clue that cancer might be in the future. Those women were gonna offer additional screenings like MRIs. And then we have the high risk category. Usually these people have gene mutations when we do genetic testing. Their risk can be up to 85%. So we're gonna offer above and beyond measures, which should be increased screening, but maybe even medications to reduce their risk, and then even surgical interventions mm -hmm. like a mastectomy mm -hmm. to, to reduce their risk. Now, if you're wondering, hey, I'm not in, I'm not in the high risk group, thankfully, it's still very important that you're on top of your breast health. Most breast cancers originate in the average risk group. So a lot of women I've diagnosed will tell me, but nobody in my family has breast cancer. How could I? Um, because we do stress the importance of people with family history to get good screening. But really, just by being a female is enough that you should be aware and educated on your breast health. So now we have the knowledge. And I want to give you just a few action pieces that you can take away today. The next step would be understanding your personal family history and using that to know what your risk is. And now that we're kind of going into the holiday season almost, mm -hmm. um, uh, you're probably going to have maybe some opportunity to even gather that information and talk to some family yeah. members. Good so that conversation. Yeah, you want to find out three things. Who's had cancer and any type of cancer, not just breast. Um, who's, had bre who's had cancer, what type of cancer, and how old they were when they were diagnosed. That all helps us calculate your risk and also let us know if you qualify for things like genetic testing. Once you get your risk level, put together an action plan that makes sense for you. If you fall into the average versus the elevated versus that high risk, make a plan that makes sense for you based on the ages of when people develop breast cancer, what type, how aggressive it was, if there's any gene mutations. Breast care now needs to be more personalized than ever. 
once you've created a plan for yourself, then I encourage you to share this information with someone you love. A lot of people don't get this education uh, until it's too late. So once you've taken care of yourself, please share this information uh, and, and my presentation with anyone that you think it could help them as well. Thank you so much. And if we do have a few minutes, I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. Yeah. Do we have any questions in the chat by yeah, chance, Josh? One, which is how often should you be getting a mammogram normally? Mm -hmm. And how often for someone with a history of breast cancer? Yeah. So for any woman, the recommendation is mammography yearly. Sometimes we do it more commonly if something is seen and they want to double check it in six months. But for just regular screening, even in a high risk individual, we don't want to do more than once a year. There is radiation in the mammogram, so we don't want to over blast to the breast with radiation, which is why typically you heard me say a few times MRI or ultrasound. Both of those don't have any radiation and um, have both been found to find more breast cancers than mammography. So, uh, so mammogram once a year in a survivor. It would still be once a year, but if they don't have breasts, like they had a double mastectomy, then we usually don't do any imaging at all. But if they still have their breasts, like a lumpectomy, or they only removed one breast, then it would be yearly. And one additional question was on the additional imaging. Is that generally covered by insurance, or is it something you have to pay for out of pocket? Mm, yeah, question. yeah, that's a great question. I get asked this almost every day, uh, and I totally understand the concern with healthcare costs. So usually, when you calculate out that risk, you can make a really strong argument for the people who do qualify. And most insurances, the cutoff is twenty percent. If you have a twenty percent defined risk of breast cancer, then you qualify for something like an MRI. But most of the time, it does apply to the deductible. It's not a free screening like yearly mammograms or yearly pap tests are. And so um, it may apply to your deductible if you have a large deductible. There are several hospitals locally, and I'm sure uh, if you're out of state or, or not in this region, you may want to check with the hospitals local to you that do offer self-pay MRIs. Mm -hmm. Um, the ones around this area, they're about $299. So if your insurance doesn't cover it well or you have a very high deductible plan, that might be a little bit of a cost savings. And one last question. Is there a day ultrasound will replace mammography? A day that ultrasound will replace mammography? I don't think so, but I don't know the future. But they are trying to do uh, improvements to mammography. Mammography has really been the gold standard. And mammography is really good at seeing stage zero breast cancer, which ideally, if you're going to have breast cancer, you want it at stage zero. Um, MRI and ultrasound tend to miss those very easily. Uh, MRI also has a high false positive rate, so we use the mammogram to help fill in some of the gaps even on those imaging. But there is a lot of talk of improving mammograms itself, maybe even using contrast dye like we use in MRIs and using it in mammograms to make it kind of a poor man's MRI and give them that added benefit. So if I see anything, I see more improvements to the mammogram than replacing it. Actually, one final question. Someone asking about their personal risk, saying their maternal grandma had breast cancer. I've had cervix cells go bonkers in my 30s. Would you mm -hmm. call me, classify me as high risk? Mm -hmm. That's a real small piece of information, honestly. When I do a risk assessment, I'm asking everything from some of the things you heard me talk about as risk factors. We're looking at uh, your, your height and weight, so your BMI. If you have children, how old you were when you had children, hormone exposure with hormone replacement therapies, uh, any other cancers in your family besides that one breast cancer. Thankfully, cervical cancer has no connection with breast cancer. Um, and so that is not going to impact your risk. But there would be a lot more questions I'd want to ask before I made a generalized statement, yes or no. But I think that having that family history definitely starts to make you think, let's make sure we ask those additional questions so you're placed in the right risk category. All right, perfect. Great questions, guys. Yeah. Uh, if anyone else does have a question, please feel free to throw them in the chat, email Jennifer um, or us here at Apex. And we'll be sure to make sure that we connect you. Um, but thank you so much for your yeah, time and sharing you. your story. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and for our viewers, we will see you next month for our November webinar. Have a great day. Thank you.